In 1905, Teddy Roosevelt made this speech in Chicago. I wish to preach not the doctrine of the ignoble ease, but the doctrine of the strenuous life, the life of toil and effort, of labor and strife, to preach the highest form of success which comes not to the man who desires mere peace, but to the man who does not shrink from danger from hardship or from bitter toil, and who out of these wins the splendid ultimate triumph. <laughs> Two, a life of slothful ease, a life of that peace which springs merely from lack either of desire or of power to strive after great things, is as little worthy of a nation as of an individual. I ask only that what every self-respecting American demands from himself and from his sons shall be demanded of the American nation as a whole. Who among you would teach your boys that ease, that peace, is to be the first consideration in their eyes, to be the ultimate goal after which they strive? You have done your share, and more than your share, in making America great because you neither preach nor practice such a doctrine. You work yourselves, and you bring up your sons to work. If you are rich and worth your salt, you will teach your sons that though they may have leisure, it is not to be spent in idleness, for wisely used leisure merely means that those who possess it, being free from the necessity of working for their livelihood, are all the more bound to carry on some kind of non-remunerative work in science, in letters, in art, in exploration, in historical research. Work of the type we most need in this country, the successful carrying out of which reflects most honor upon the nation. We do not admire the man of timid peace. We admire the man who embodies victorious effort. The man who never wrongs his neighbor, who is prompt to help a friend, but who has those virile qualities necessary to win in the stern strife of actual life. It is hard to fail but it is worse never to have tried to succeed. In this life, we get nothing save by effort. Freedom from effort in the present merely means that there has been stored up effort in the past. A man can be freed from the necessity of work only by the fact that he or his fathers before him have worked to good purpose. If the freedom thus purchased is used aright, and the man still does actual work, though a different kind, whether as a writer or a general, whether in the fields of politics or in the field of exploration and adventure, he shows he deserves his good fortune. But if he treats this period of freedom from the need of actual labor as a period 
not of preparation, but of mere enjoyment, even though perhaps not of vicious enjoyment. He shows that he is simply a cumberer of the earth's surface, and he surely unfits himself to hold his own with his fellows if the need to do so should arise again. A mere life of ease is not, in the end, a very satisfactory life, and, above all, it is a life which ultimately unfits those who follow it for serious work in the world. Three. In the last analysis, a healthy state can exist only when the men and women who make it up lead clean, vigorous, healthy lives. When the children are so trained that they shall endeavor not to shirk difficulties, but to overcome them, not to seek ease, but to know how to wrest triumph from toil and risk. The man must be glad to do a man's work, to dare and endure and to labor, to keep himself and to keep those dependent upon them. The woman must be the housewife, the helpmate of the homemaker, the wise and fearless mother of many healthy children. Four, as it is with the individual, so it is with the nation. It is a base untruth to say that happy is the nation that has no history. Thrice happy is the nation that has a glorious history. Far better it is to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered by failure, than to take rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy much nor suffer much, because they live in the gray twilight that knows not victory nor defeat. If, in 1861, the men who loved the Union had believed that peace was the end of all things and had acted up to their belief, we should have saved hundreds of thousands of lives. We would have saved millions of dollars. Moreover, besides saving all the blood and treasure we then lavished, we would have prevented the heartbreak of many women, the dissolution of many homes, and we would have spared the country those months of gloom and shame when it seemed as if our armies marched only to defeat. We could have avoided all this suffering simply by shrinking from strife. And if we had thus avoided it, we would have shown that we were weaklings and that we were unfit to stand among the great nations of the earth. Thank God for the iron in the blood of our fathers, the men who upheld the wisdom of Lincoln and bore sword or rifle in the armies of Grant. Let us the children of the men who proved themselves equals to the mighty days, let us, the children of the men who carried the great civil war to a triumphant conclusion, praise the God of our fathers that the ignoble counsels of peace were rejected, that the suffering and loss, the blackness, of sorrow and despair were unflinchingly faced and the years of strife endured for in the end the slave was freed the union restored 
and the mighty American Republic placed once more as a helmeted queen among nations. Five. We of this generation do not have to face a task such as that our fathers faced, but we have our own tasks, and woe to us if we fail to perform them. We cannot, if we would, play the part of China and be content to rot by inches in ignoble ease within our borders, taking no interest in what goes on beyond them, sunk in a scrambling commercialism, heedless of the higher life, the life of aspiration, of toil and risk, busying ourselves only with the wants of our bodies for the day, until suddenly we should find, beyond a shadow of question, what China has already found, that in this world, the nation that has trained itself to a career of unwarlike and isolated ease is bound, in the end, to go down before other nations which have not lost the manly and adventurous qualities. If we are to be a really great people, we must strive in good faith to play a great part in the world. We cannot avoid meeting great issues. All that we can determine for ourselves is whether we shall meet them well or ill. In 1898, we could not help being brought face to face with the problem of war with Spain. All we could decide was whether we should sink like cowards from the contest or enter into it as beseemed a brave and high-spirited people and, once in, whether failure or success should crown our banners, so it is now. We cannot avoid the responsibilities that confront us in Hawaii, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. All we can decide is whether we shall meet them in a way that will redound to the national credit, or whether we shall make our dealings with these new problems a dark and shameful page in our history. To refuse to deal with them at all merely amounts to dealing with them badly. We have a given problem to solve. If we undertake the solution, there is, of course, always danger. We cannot possibly solve it aright. But to refuse to undertake the solution simply renders it certain that we cannot possibly solve it aright. The timid man the lazy man, the man who distrusts his country, the over-civilized man who has lost the great fighting, masterful virtues, the ignorant man and the man of dull mind, whose soul is incapable of feeling the mighty lift that thrills stern men with empires in their brains. All these, of course, shrink from seeing the nation undertake its new duties, shrink from seeing us build a navy and an army adequate to our needs, shrink from seeing us do our share of world's work by bringing order out of chaos in the great, fair tropic islands from which the valor of our soldiers and sailors has driven the Spanish flag. These are the men who fear the strenuous life, 
who fear the only national life which is really worth leading. They believe in that cloistered life which saps the hardy virtues in a nation, as it saps them in the individual, or else they are wedded to that base spirit of gain and greed which recognizes the commercialism, the be-all and end-all of national life, instead of realizing that, though an indispensable element it is, after all, but one of the many elements that go to make up true national greatness. No country can long endure if its foundations are not laid deep in the material prosperity which comes from thrift, from business energy and enterprise, from hard unsparing effort in the fields of industrial activity. But neither was any nation ever yet truly great if it relied upon material prosperity alone. All honor must be paid to the architects of our national prosperity, to the great captains of industry who have built our factories and our railroads, to the strong men who toil for wealth with brain or hand, for great is the debt of our nation to these and their kind. But our debt is yet greater to the men whose highest type is to be found in a statesman like Lincoln, a soldier like Grant, they showed by their lives that they recognized the law of work, the law of strife. They toiled to win a competence for themselves and those dependent upon them, but they recognized that there were yet other and even loftier duties, duties to the nation and duties to the race. We cannot sit huddled within our own borders and avow ourselves merely an assemblage of well-to-do hucksters who care nothing for what happens beyond. Such a policy would defeat even its own end, for as the nations grow to have ever wider and wider interests, and are brought into closer and closer contact. If we are to hold our own struggle for naval and commercial supremacy, we must build up our power within our own borders. We must build the Isthmian Canal, and we must grasp the points of vantage which will enable us to have our say in deciding the destiny of the oceans of the East and the West. Seven. I preach to you, my countrymen, that our country calls not for the life of ease, but for the life of strenuous endeavor. The 20th century looms before us, big, with the fate of many nations. If we stand idly by, if we seek merely swollen, slothful ease and ignoble peace, if we shrink from the hard contests where men must win at hazard of their lives and at the risk of all they hold dear, then the bolder, and stronger peoples will pass us by and will win for themselves the domination of the world. Let us, therefore, boldly face the life of strife, resolute to do our duty well and manfully, resolute to uphold righteousness by deed and by word, 
resolute to be both honest and brave, to serve high ideals, yet to use practical methods. Above all, let us shrink from no strife, moral or physical, within or without the nation, provided we are certain that the strife is justified. For it is only through strife, through hard and dangerous endeavor, that we shall ultimately win the goal of true national greatness. City, National League for Women's Service, Biltmore Hotel, September 18th, 1918. War at the present day is, I think, more terrible than it has ever been in the past. And at the same time, more is done to help the soldier who fights than has ever been the case in the past. The fighting man, the men on the other side, our sons and our brothers, have to go against every species of death by torture which the minds of man can imagine. I believe they suffer a greater risk than ever was endured in a similar space of time by any soldier before.